glad you're here today. If you haven't been to my channel before, my name is Dana. I'm a mom of two, a wife. I love Jesus. I love to talk about all things motherhood, lifestyle, wellness, and of course, the Word of God. So subscribe to this channel if you want more of this type of life-giving content in your subscription box and make sure to hit that bell button to be notified of all future videos. We are currently, my family and I, in self-imposed quarantine. It kind of reminds me of when I had newborns and just the kind of lifestyle change that that imposes, except there is uh, no toilet paper. It's a crazy time and there's a spirit of fear everywhere you go. And I don't know if you sensed it, but it's there, it's prevalent, and I don't want to live by fear. I don't believe that we have to live in fear just because it's around us. And I think more than ever, we get to shine as believers because we are unafraid or called to be unafraid. And the way that we can do that is because of his love that we know is real and true and deep and wide, and it covers us and it covers everything that we do. My prayer for you this season, no matter what season you're in, but specifically if you're in quarantine season with me, is that you would use this time to just dive deeper into God's presence, that you would use this time to build your faith and not your fear, to inundate yourself with the word, with worship, with prayer, and that you would come out of this season closer to Jesus than ever before. That's what I want for all of us. So we're going to read 1 John chapter 4, verses 16 through 19. So go ahead, grab whatever your Bible you're going to read. Mine is going to read really differently. So if you have your app, a Bible app, make sure to put it on the Passion Translation. It'll be helpful. Okay, verse 16. We have come into an intimate experience with God's love, and we trust in the love he has for us. God is love. Those who are living in love are living in God, and God lives through them. Well, by living in God, love has been brought to its full expression in us so that we may fearlessly face the day of judgment. Because all that Jesus now is, so are we in this world. Love never brings fear, for fear is always related to punishment. But love's perfection drives the fear of punishment far from our hearts. Whoever walks constantly afraid of punishment has not reached love's perfection. Our love for others is our grateful response to the love God first demonstrated to us. Whew. Well, I actually want to look up in the Discover the Bible for Yourself book. I'm going to go to first John. Now, John, the one that wrote this book, he's also the one that wrote the book of Revelation and had that crazy vision on Patmos. And he's talking right now to the church and he's trying to warn them of deception. He's trying to warn them of Gnosticism, a teaching that, you know, God is removed from us. Like he is around, but he is really not in our lives. He's trying to warn them and he's telling them in this book over and over to abide, to have fellowship, to, to know God's love, to be born of God, to have light and truth and to stay away from sin and darkness and hate. And I think this is a, a perfect book to look at right now. He's contrasting basically the world, the enemy, sin and death and hate. And he's contrasting that with light and love and the gospel and hope in Jesus. So that makes sense when he's saying right here in verse 16, we have come into an intimate experience with God's love and we trust the love he has for us. Trust is the biggest determining factor of whether or not we will be living in the world, but not of it or of the world and in the philosophies and the fear of the world and acting and reacting the way that the world does, or if we will be acting and responding from a place of knowing who we are and trusting the love that he has for us. Then he says, God is love. Those who are living in love are living in God and God lives through them. If we want to know whether or not we are pressing into the Lord and, and glorifying God, are we living in love? You know, and the opposite of love is not hate, but selfishness. It's this self-centered attitude towards life, towards others. And are we living in a self-centered attitude or are we living in a God-centered and other-centered and uh, submitted to the Lord in love mindset. Because when we do, God lives through us. God gets to live through us, to 
operate in our lives in such a way where we are his hands and feet when we're living in love and not selfishness. By living in God, love has been brought to its full expression in us so that we may fearlessly face the day of judgment because all that Jesus now is, so are we in this world. Wow. That second half of that verse really is sticking out to me so that we may fearlessly face the day of judgment because all that Jesus now is, so are we in this world. And so I'm even reading the footnote here and it says for this last part, because all that Jesus now is, so are we in this world. It's saying, or the, another way to say it is because we are what he is in this world. The verb tense is important. We are not like Jesus was, but because of grace, we are like how he is now, pure, holy, seated in heaven and glorified. And then it has verse references if you want those. Romans 8, 30, Ephesians 2, 6, Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Faith has transferred his righteousness to us. So that's how we are in this world. Pure, holy, seated in heaven and glorified. Like that is an entirely different way to operate and maneuver in life than fearful, than in scarcity, than in lack. Like that just, that mindset that leads us there is of the world and not of the kingdom of God. It's saying that I am... God doesn't see me. He doesn't know me. He's not going to be there for me. It's basically like a pauper mentality or a, a an orphan mentality of I don't have a father who sees me, who wants to love me, who is going to provide and protect me. I am not a princess, a prince in the kingdom of God that has a royal right to the throne, that has dignity, that has respect and honor. When we lose our identity in his love, then we are walking around fearful and scared and in lack. And whenever I feel those feelings coming on, I know that my identity in his love has shifted into being an orphan, into being a pauper, instead of being a, a loved daughter, a loved royal daughter in the kingdom of God. And then I get to walk pure and holy in this world. Love never brings fear, for fear is always related to punishment. But love's perfection drives the fear of punishment far from our hearts. I love this. I just, this made me think of my daughter. I'm not going to even say which one, but she's right now. I'm kind of talking to her and trying to give her guidance because every time that we find something has happened or like toys weren't put away that we said to put away. Or her sister says, she shut the door on me. And I'm saying, did you shut the door on your sister? There's always a defensiveness. There can even be just straight up lies coming out of her sweet little mouth of just, no, no, mom, I didn't do it. Wasn't me, didn't do it. I'm trying to get across to her right now that it's more important to be honest than it is to be good, to give the impression that you're good. Because right now she's lying to cover up the fact that she wasn't behaving good. And she wants to keep her reputation before me as being a good little girl, more than she wants to be honest with me about what happened and what she did. The key is in this verse right here, love never brings fear. Fear is always related to punishment. But love's perfection drives the fear of punishment far from our hearts. Listen, we are not unlike my daughter. So many times we wanna come with a good reputation before the Lord. We wanna come with a good reputation before people. And we're constantly trying to cover up the ways that we sin, the ways that we are wrong, the ways that we don't measure up, the ways that we don't even measure up to what we say and the things that we've said that we want to be or to do or what we think is right. We don't even measure up to our own standards. And we don't want to show that to people. We want to show a polished picture so many times. We're really terrified of being real with people and saying, you know, I yelled at my kids yesterday or I am drinking every night way more than I should or I have serious issues with my sexuality. Like there are things that are like taboo to us in the Christian church that shouldn't be because we're not trying to just show up to God with good rep good reputation. We're not trying to show up to the people of God with good reputations, but with honest hearts that say, I am in need of saving. I'm in need of renewing. I'm in need of transformation. Jesus said in, in Luke chapter five, I did not come for the healthy, for those who are well. 
I came for those who were sick. Basically, I came for those who admit that they're sick because we all are. And the Pharisees are the ones who were trying to pretend they were healthy. And he said, I can't help you. I can't help you. As a doctor, I can't help you if you don't admit that you are sick and that you need helping. But if you would just admit your sickness, if you would just admit that you need saving, then I'm going to come to your aid and I'm going to save you. I'm going to set you free. I'm going to transform you. So that's my encouragement from this verse. Love never brings fear. Fear is always related to punishment. If there are ways in your life where you're trying to show up with a good reputation before God, break it down. Break down the walls of trying to be perfect and come to him with all of your baggage. He already knows already. So just tell him. Sit down in prayer and say, this is the things that I'm thinking. These are the ways that I've sinned against you. And these are the ways that I've sinned against other people. God, forgive me. There's nothing like having the slate wiped clean instead of having to act and do all these things to try to balance the scales. But you can't ever balance the scales anyway. So just drop the pretense and be honest before the Lord. And I think in that honesty, more and more, every time that we are going deeper with the Lord in relationship and deeper into his forgiveness and his healing, that's where transformation comes. Because love is the thing that is missing every time that we are fearful, every time that we are anxious. If according to this word, according to this verse, if we're in fear, then it's always related to a lack of understanding and believing God's love. And if we have a lack of understanding and believing God's love, then deep down under it all, it's this fear of being punished. And the more and more that we realize the punishment has been put on Jesus and that he forgives us every single time that we come to him with our falling shorts, we will have more and more confidence in his love and how big and how wide and how deep it is and how much it covers us. And we won't fear punishment anymore. And the, the, the punishment being driven out from our hearts, the fear of punishment driven from our hearts will produce love's perfection. Okay, let's continue on. Whoever walks constantly afraid of punishment has not le reached love's perfection. Our love for others is our grateful response to the love God first demonstrated to us. We love because God first loved us. It's another way that it says in a different translation. It's a grateful response. Listen, if you have a hard time loving your spouse, if you have a hard time loving your friends and the people around you and they just annoy you and they bother you more than anything else, you're probably not gonna fix that starting off by deciding to try harder or even writing a gratitude list about that person. Those are great things to do but they're not the root problem. The root problem is that we have not experienced or understood or fully embraced in our hearts how loved that we are by God. Because if we did, the perfection of his love would flow out to others automatically. This would be an automatic overflow response. I'm not saying every single time, like it's not going to be that every single day I wake up and I feel overflowingly loving to all these people, but more and more it can become my automatic response. And more and more as I'm in his love and I'm rooted and grounded in it, the fruit that comes out of me, I don't have to sit there and try to produce good fruit of loving other people because my roots are where I'm focusing. I'm focusing on my roots going deep, getting the sustenance of God's love, his peace, his joy, his presence, and then the fruit comes automatically. I'm not sitting there trying to stop being angry as much as I'm just focusing on being loved by the Lord. And that is going to produce the fruit of patience, produce the fruit of kindness and gentleness and self-control and love. I'm interested to know right now as I'm going through this, what's sticking out to you? What revelations you're getting from this? Because I know that it's chock full. I know one time my husband, he's a teaching pastor and he was encouraging me on how to think deeper and get deeper into the word. And he was, he was saying, um, one thing he practices, which I think is really awesome is to take one verse and over the course of a couple days or a week, write out 100 observations about that one verse. And he's like, I'll take a verse and for the whole week, I will just be meditating on that verse. I'll be thinking about it, thinking about it, trying to dig, trying to find another observation. And if I can make it a point to try to write 100 observations, all of a sudden you'll start to see patterns and you'll start to see things appearing and you'll get these deeper revelations of the word that you never thought were there. And he's like, I guarantee you that you can find 100 observations on almost every verse, every verse in the Bible. Even Jesus wept, the shortest one. Okay, I'm gonna look at this book real quick. The worst, the West 
word dictionary. Saying in verse 17 that being made perfect is perfect tense. This represents a past fact in the saint's life and a present reality. This is love with us, the love that God poured out in our hearts. And the person, the saint, who in his earthly life has had the love that God is in his nature, brought to its full capacity of operation by the Holy Spirit, it results in a life devoted entirely to the Lord. It results in a life of unreservedness of speech, of free and fearless confidence with nothing to hide or be ashamed of. In that kind of life, the saint has nothing of which to be ashamed at the judgment of his works. That kind of life is a Christ-like life, and that makes the saint, as he dwells in the midst of a world of sinful people, like Christ. And the Lord Jesus will not, at the judgment seat of Christ, condemn those who, while they lived on earth, were like him. But we can have free and fearless confidence, free and fearless confidence in his love, that we can walk holy and pure in this world as he is in this world. Because we have absolutely no fear of being condemned. We have nothing to hide and we have complete confidence because of his love. And again, in verse 19, when it's talking about loving others, it's saying we've loved him. We love because he himself first loved us. The thought is that the amazing love of God in Christ is the inspiration of all the love that stirs in our hearts. It awakens within us an answering love, a grateful love for him, manifesting itself in love for our brethren. His love is what stirs all other love inside of us for others. His love stirs all other love. So I'm just going to pray. That's what I feel led to do right now. I'm going to pray and then we'll have some questions, some ways to get deeper into what we read today. And then I'll leave the comments open. So God, help us to get deeper into your love, Lord. We know that your love stirs all other love. We know that your love casts out all fear, that we can have fearless, bold confidence knowing that there is absolutely nothing that we need to hide or be ashamed of or condemned by. God, I just pray for every single person watching this right now, Lord, that wherever they are at in their lives, whatever, whatever trial they are facing, Lord, that you would put a bold confidence in them of how loved they are, that they would have a fearlessness in approaching those things because they know that their end in you is good, it's beautiful, it's perfect that there's nothing to fear in your love, that they are royalty, they are not orphans, they are not castaways, they are not paupers, Lord. They've been called your royal sons and daughters. And they can have confidence in your love to face whatever trials that come their way. God, I pray that we would go deeper into your love and deeper into your words in this season and always, Lord, draw us into your heart. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that you are faithful in all that you do towards us. We love you, we worship you, in Jesus' name, amen. I have two follow-up questions from what we just read. First one is, what are some ways that you try to cast out fear, you try to get rid of fear, other than Jesus, other than relying on his love, other than leaning into God's love? Second question is, are you trying to hide or have a good reputation before the Lord, before just being honest, and realizing his forgiveness is endless. So are you more focused on having a good reputation before the Lord or being honest and real and letting him forgive you? Please leave a comment. Let me know if you have answers to those questions or if you have any revelation or insight that you received from this chapter or, or anything else. I am so glad that we got to do this again. It's been a little while that I really, really feel like this is something the Lord has put on my heart to do. Hit that like button if you enjoyed this. It really gives me a hint that this is the content that you want to see. Also subscribe, have a beautiful, amazing week, be blessed, we'll see you next time.